Yeah. So we'll just uh, go ahead and get started. Is that okay? Yeah, let's hit it. <laughs> Easiest right, way cool. to go, Woo! right? Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome back to the LaFrance Paradigm. I'm your host, Robert LaFrance, and this is where we learn and share strategies for an impact. If you are a veteran, if you are a father, if you are an entrepreneur interested in building multiple streams of income in an empire and your legacy for your family or just something to uh, have some financial stability, you're in the right place. I have a co-host today. My guest is Mr. Brian Briscoe. Mm -hmm. How are you doing today? Doing great. Thanks, Robert. I appreciate your time. Absolutely. I appreciate you taking the time to book an appointment in a podcast session uh, yeah. because I love it when my resources actually work for me. <laughs> It's right. Great. Yeah. Yeah. So social media works sometimes. Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Brian is a Marine veteran. We're going to go into that. We're going to talk mm -hmm. about Four Oaks Capital and the tribe mm -hmm. of Titans, as you see behind him. And I also want to touch on the 26 units that you just acquired yeah. and go into a little bit about your backstory and how we get there. Okay. Um, awesome. So, Let's do it. Perfect. I'm excited. You know, like I said, uh, the listeners here are veterans and entrepreneurs, fathers, people interested in investing in real estate and really leveraging that. That's a big mm -hmm. wave right now, um, especially if you're in the military community and you're using your VA home loan, not just to buy your primary residence, but you're seeing, yo, know, I can actually use my VA loan to buy a multifamily. And so yep. this is kind of where new uh, real estate investors and, and veterans especially start learning all the things that they can do to get ready for retirement, whether they're, you know, mm -hmm. retiring or getting out early. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your story, you know, your, your time in service, what made you join the military yeah. throughout that period? And when you started your real estate investing journey? Absolutely. So um, funny thing in, in high school, a buddy of mine got a Naval Academy scholarship. And I remember telling him, you know, going into the military is an absolute waste of, of time, you know? And I mean, that it's kind of, kind of ironic because, you know, 25 or almost 30 years later, um, you know, I'm, I'm a 20 year veteran of the Marine Corps. Right. So um, I wasn't, you know, in, in high school, military was the furthest thing from my mind. And, you know, when I was 19, um, I went on a mission for my church. You know, it was the first time I spent any time outside of, of the U S and I spent two years in South America, you know, in, in Chile. And I saw the difference between how we lived and how they lived. You know, I oh, yeah. thought I grew up poor because, you know, we were a, you know, middle-class, maybe kind of a lower middle-class family living in a regular middle-class neighborhood, you know, and we had less than the kids around me. So I thought we grew up poor until I saw, you know, how the Chileans lived, you know, and they're, they're actually, you know, upper tier for South America. So I came back from that experience, you know, one of one of the guys that I met there was a Marine reservist. And I came back from that experience, you know, really thinking, you know, man, I'm so fortunate for living here in America. You know, we have so many opportunities, the rest of the world doesn't. And you know, I kept on thinking about that conversation, one conversation I had with a guy that was a Marine reservist. And so I joined the reserves, you know, and that was it, you know, I was a um, reservist and I was a private first class, you know, and since most people are vets, you know, basically bottom of the barrel in the Marine Corps when September 11th happened. Now, fortunately, I mean, depending on how you look at it, I already had a degree you know, in September, I had a degree when I went to boot camp. They just, uh, you know, wouldn't let me commission straight out the gates. But, you know, September 11th happened. I was in graduate school and I decided that I would um, go active duty. And I went to the officer selection officer and applied for officer candidate school. And, you know, I, I, I was very adamant that I was only going to do my initial obligation, which was three and a half years based on how I came in. Um, but somewhere on the long, along the line, you know, things change, you know, we, um, we ended up having several kids, you know, I, I was married at the time. Um, I now have five kids, you know, so you talk about, wow. you know, the parenting aspect, I can definitely talk about that. Um, so, you know, 2001, early 2002, I went active duty, never really looked back, um, along the way, you know, and you mentioned the VA loan. I picked up my first property using a 0% down VA loan, you know, and it. it was, it was an investment property. Now there are ways, um, you know, you're supposed to be an owner occupant, but uh, you know, this, this property, I think was a fun example of how you can get creative. 
um, I bought this house from my, my father-in-law and right before moving to boot camp, I moved in, you know, I moved my wife and my, my young daughter at the time into my in-laws house. And I happened to renew my driver's license while I was living there. And so the address on my driver's license was the address of the first property I bought. And it was also my military home of record. All right. And so, you know, five, six years into the Marine Corps, well, about five years into the Marine Corps, I was looking for an investment property. And my father-in-law realized I was looking for an investment property and says, hey, why don't you buy mine? You know, and I'm like, okay, you know, sounds good. You know, and um, he basically said, hey, we'll do it without a realtor. We'll get it appraised and I'll take, you know, obviously 6% commission off the top. And because you're my son-in-law, we'll get it appraised and I'll just drop the price 10%. Wow. I'm like, Boom. You know, so um, that's what I did. I used the VA loan and because it was my home of record, because it was on my driver's license, um, you know, because we had intent of moving there, um, we were able to get the VA loan, you know, and that, uh, um, that ended up working out pretty well for us. I remember, I think we had to pay the funding fee out of pocket. We had to pay like $3,000 out of pocket uh, for what at the time was a $200,000 home, right? So, um, that the VA loan works really well. You know, uh, a year later, we picked up our second investment property, um, this time using an FHA loan, and we had to put three and a half percent down. But, you know, it, it was one of those things where it's just like, okay, you know, I can put three and a half percent down. Uh, this is 2008. So two, I bought the first house pre crash. Um, fortunately, in a metro that didn't have a significant downturn during the crash, it kind of Good. flattened out, it didn't go down. Um, I bought my second investment property in San Diego a year after the crash. So, you know, um, almost, you know, almost 50% what it was worth two years prior. So um, for, and I, I thought it was a steal, you know, um, we didn't time the bottom perfectly, you know, there was still a little bit of settling. Um, but, you know, we, for, I think, I think 15,000 out of pocket, you know, we bought a $300,000 home and, wow. um, Incidentally, when we closed on the property, I already had orders leaving the city, you know, and it was, you know, I was, we were in San Diego stationed there and I had orders to, uh, to North Carolina. Um, so, and end of the day, you know, one thing that's great about being in the military is there, there's a lot of things that, um, you know, you have the soldier and sailors civil relief act. I think they changed the name of that recently, but, uh, um, the, the, the whole one year rule doesn't really apply to you anymore if you have orders, you know? So, you know, we moved in that house, we lived there for like six months and, um, then we moved and we turned it into a rental. Right. So, um, anyway, that, that kind of, I got the appetite for real estate and, you know, at the time I was a captain, you know, and, you know, depending on, you know, what, what side of the fence you're sitting on, you know, if you're an enlisted side of the fence, you know, captains make a lot of money, you know, and it's compared to enlisted, they do, um, you know, but I, I tried to get a third home loan off of, a, you know, a single income and all of a sudden banks told me no. And I think one of yeah. the, one of the things I, I wish I would have done is, is talk to more than one bank. I called one bank, you know, and said, I want to buy a house in North Carolina now. And this would have been 2010 timeframe. And, you know, the first lender said, you're already overextended. You know, you've got a single income, you've got two properties, you're already overextended. And uh, um, so essentially, I just started saving up money from there. And I, and I began my, um, you know, next house fund, my next real estate purchase fund. Um, and over the years, it grew and it took me, it took me a while. You know, I had a couple of deployments, you know, 2009, 2010, 2000, let's say 2009, 2011, I spent you know, the bulk of both those years deployed. Um, and then 2012, they, I got a school seat at Naval Postgraduate School, which consumed a lot of my time. Um, did another overseas tour and then another deployment, you know, and, and you put all that, put all that stuff together. Um, I didn't do much real estate between there, but I essentially wanted to get back into the game. Um, I now had two properties that I own. This is like 2016, 2017 timeframe, two properties that I've owned for, you know, eight years. They were doing well. They had appreciated a lot. It was proof of concept for me. And so from there, I decided that I wanted to do um, apartments. You know, I figured that's, that's kind of the next step for me. Um, and, you know, the last three years of active duty, you know, I was 
you know, hustling nights and weekends, trying to, you know, purchase as many apartments as we could, as I could found partners, got a lot of, got a lot of help doing it. Um, but, you know, fast forward to where we are right now, you know, you mentioned that the 26 unit we closed on, um, on Monday, two days ago from when we we're recording. Um, but including that one, you know, I'm a, a general partner or a general partner on 650, um, apartment units right now. Nice. Good for you. Yeah. Good for you. Awesome. So let me go back to the very beginning because you, mm -hmm. you sounded like you knew that you were going to buy a house. I mean, not only are you a family man, you have to be a provider and stuff like that, but Whereas some people think, like see the advantages of renting a house or renting an apartment, um, you know, all depends on who you're talking to and what your needs are as a family. What sparked your interest to purchase a home and then a second home at the age you know, of the, and where you were in your career? It was, it was about, you know, about the same time that I read Rich Dad Poor Dad. And it was the idea of accumulating assets. You know, and, um, you know, Robert Kiyosaki, I mean, some people like how he says this, some people don't where your, your primary resident is not an asset, it's an expense. You know, I kind of, I kind of looked at that and said, okay, how can I build assets? Um, he talks a lot about real estate and very much about commercial real estate in Rich Dad, Poor Dad and cash flow Quadrant. Um, at the time, I didn't think that I could do anything commercial. You know, I, I, I figured residential was something that I could handle. And so, I was on a quest to, to basically put a bunch of things into the asset column. And, you know, like I, I, I bought two houses in, in two years, um, you know, two big assets in the asset column. You know, I bought them both as primary residences and, you know, used the, the military card to, um, you know, be able to rent those out, you know, quickly after purchasing them, you know. So, um, yeah, end of the day, what was going through my mind was, you know, just trying to, um, trying to build assets. And, you know, to, to further answer that question, every time we moved, you know, we looked at the, the real estate market and we made the determination whether we were going to buy or whether we were going to rent. And it turns out we rented more than we bought um, in, in 20 years in the military, you know, so I, I moved to Monterey, California. And at the time, the average single family home was $750,000, mm -hmm. but I could rent something for 2,500, you know, and, and when you look at the mortgage costs and, and, and everything else, you know, I didn't see um, buying there to be advantageous for us. You know, we lived, we lived uh, in, in San Diego a second time and it was the same, same dynamic, you know, house prices had gone up, had almost doubled since I had previously lived there and rents hadn't gone up that much. So you know, a lot of times when I'd go in, I would look at, you know, what my mortgage would cost me, compare that to rents. And if it looked like I'd be able to live somewhere for three years on an owner occupant loan and be able to cash flow when we moved out, we would buy. And um, because I spent, you know, nine, nine of the last 12 years in Southern, in, in California, um, you know, it didn't work out as much as we wanted it to. Yeah, it's important that you look at those factors and you run the numbers. I mean, a lot of a new real estate investor could just buy a property because they're excited and they know that owning real estate and equity and forced savings and all the advantages that people hear about. But it's really important about buying right. You know, my yeah. friend, Mike Foster, military Mike, he I know really him. nails that home. Every time I go to an event, he's like, buy right. He says it probably 100 yeah. times. You know, and yeah. it's really important that you run the numbers and you and, and you know what you're getting into. And if you want a house hack or if you want to get creative with whatever it is that you are purchasing, you know, I, I was stationed in Connecticut and I was stationed in Virginia Beach. And both of those markets, I knew that I could buy a house and I knew that the rents were about 10 percent over my mortgage because that's what like property management companies were charging, you know, what I mean, mm -hmm. to break even. So yeah. it's like, OK where am I going to put this? And then of course I rented some rooms and then I went on deployment. I also deployed to uh, central South America. I was on the uh, joint partnership, Southern joint partnership station. I went to mm -hmm. uh, Colombia, Belize, Honduras, and Guatemala. And when yeah. you're talking about way of living down there, it's, it's different. It is different. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's one thing to drive from a port hours through the jungle and, and you know you're not near a city but you're seeing pedestrian traffic on the road you know you're seeing people burn trash on tuesdays mm -hmm. and thursdays and there's also a different um like culture and perspective of life you know when, in america in the united states when someone says oh hey what do you do that's kind of asking like what do you do for a living or how do you earn a living for you and your family how do you provide mm -hmm. 
when you go down there for the people that I met, you know, that's not really a question that they ask or, or a no. lifestyle that they live because they provide and family is always first and they just do that. That's not even a, a way of thinking. Yeah. So it's, I learned a lot when I went down there and I really tried to take back what I learned from the communities down there and implemented it, not just in my family life, but in, in, in like my business, you know, and like yeah. how I can help other people. Yeah. There, there's a, there's a lot of things about the, the Latin American culture, you know, and um, there, there are, there are a lot of, a lot of, a lot of things that I think work in all of Latin America. It's hard to, it's hard to pinpoint one culture. You know, there's differences between Colombians and there are between Hondurans, whatnot, but right. one big theme is they're, they're very big on family, you know, family first. And that's, uh, um, that's something I think we can all learn from is, you know, the family should come first. And, um, I think a lot of times we get lost in the, um, in the job, you know, we get lost in the career, we get lost in the progression, we get lost on the corporate ladder somewhere, you know, looking for that next promotion or to climb up, up on the next rung. And, and sometimes we make sacrifices that, you know, we probably shouldn't make. Yeah. Yeah. So. Family and football, soccer. Yeah, I mean, the, I was down, I was down oh, in yeah. Belize for the world cup and the coast mm -hmm. guard shut down. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, everything shuts down. And I, I remember, you know, walking around town during football games, you know, and, and um, th this is areas where, I mean, really, really poor people, they, they ba barely have a house, but they all have big screen TVs, which is crazy um, and cable. But uh, you know, you, you can walk around, you can walk down the street and not, miss a single play it's almost like you're you're listening to you got headphones in because wow. the tvs are up so loud and everybody's you know everybody's watching the national team play and it's just like yeah it's 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 a way of life yeah i think football and family you know anywhere anywhere south of our border is um common theme you talk about any one of those two things and you're gonna you know be able to talk to anybody yeah and that's something that I drive home every day. You know, when I wake up, I, I, you know, I'm grateful for waking up and having my family and having the opportunities that I do and, mm -hmm. and them being a huge motivator and influence in what I, in what I do, you know, like mm -hmm. buying cash flowing assets is going to help my family. It's yeah. going to help me be able to be there if anybody gets sick or if I want to drive and drive my kid to school and pick her up and stuff. So, you know, the ability to whether it's, you know, just one or two single families, or if it's a whole, whole portfolio, like 26 unit apartment building complex, mm -hmm. that little bit extra is sometimes all anybody really needs or is looking for based yeah. on everything else that they have going on. You know, yeah, so and that's, helpful. that's, that's, you know, something the Marines talk about a lot, and you have it kind of beaten into your head, you know, work smarter, not harder. Yeah, you know, they tell you that, that yeah, they tell you that in the Marine Corps, but, you know, if you adapt that to your entire life, you know, we've adapt, adapt that to your finances, work smarter, not harder. Um, you know, you start realizing that, hey, this rich dad, poor dad concept, this cash flow quadrant, the cash flow mindset um, is the way to go, you know, and I mean, it's, it's nice being in the military and knowing you're going to have a stable paycheck, but, you know, once again, are you working smarter or harder for that paycheck? And, you know, looking back at it, you know, I, I worked harder for 20 years. You know, I kept on saying work smarter, work not harder in my, you know, in my career, but in my own family life and in my own finances, finances, um, you know, a lot of ways I chose the hard way. I chose the 20 year career to get a pension instead of, you know, putting more assets in my asset column. But, uh, um, I mean, I'm not going to lie, you know, I, I retired as Lieutenant Colonel, the pension's nice, you know, it's, yeah, it it's, um, it, it's definitely going to really help throughout my entire life. But, uh, um, you know, could I have gotten to that level of passive income in a shorter amount of time? Had I just focused on real estate? Absolutely. Is the answer. Right. Right. So, yeah. And, um, I know, I mean, I know people who were able to buy a single family home or whatever, just buy a new property every time they relocate it. And by the time that they retire, you know, you have four or five, six rental properties. Mm -hmm. That's a similar thing as a pension or retirement. You know, you got that cash flow coming in. Yeah. And yeah, then and also just, go ahead. Let's just say just just this 26 unit. Now um I've been, I invested personal you know funds into that unit, but I've all, I'm also on the, the general partner ownership side. So I'm I'm I got some sweat equity into it as well. You know, but with you know, with the returns on my, you know, capital and the returns on my sweat equity, um, 
I'm going to average six to eight thousand dollars in income, you know, every year that we own that property. You know, we we looked at a five year hold period, and I'll, I'll probably make a windfall when we sell it because you know, the market is very likely going to keep on going up. So, I mean, you look at that, you know, one purchase $6,000 um, per year for the next five years, you know, if, if I were to stack up, you know, one, if, if I were to just do one of those deals every single year for the rest of my life, I mean, just look at how that compounds, you know, five years from now, eight years from now, I never have to work again, you know, is right. how that works. So yeah, compounding um, interest is incredible. Yeah. So um, yeah, I mean, if, if you if you're looking to to put things, I think I think like I said, work smarter, not harder. Work to put things in your asset column so that you're earning that passive income. So eventually, you don't have to go to work every day. And if you want to, you can. I mean, it's um, something you I mean, if you enjoy what you do, by all means, keep on doing it. But uh, you know, keep on putting assets in that column and keep on working smarter. That's the biggest thing too is finding that's or you know maintaining that sense of purpose and fulfillment. And for me, when I enlisted in the Navy, I was like diehard diver. I'm going to make this my career and mm-hmm. do 20 and then get out. And then as I as my military career progressed, I was I felt as though that I could do it better on my own because I had been learning yeah. about real estate and entrepreneurship and and cash flowing assets. And I was like, you know, I could definitely make up what I want in the, the difference of time in acquiring mm-hmm. assets before. I hit the age of 39, which is where I would have retired from the military. I'm 32 right now. So essentially I got, I still got cushion room. You know I mean? I want to acquire these assets ASAP, you know, and build my retirement account and everything like that. But I was like, I think I can do this better. And that was actually a huge um, aspect in my mindset, despite being a team and, and being a leader on the dive side or part of the diving community was, you know, Oftentimes when it came to my military service, I was like, you know what? I think I could do this better on my own, you know? Yeah. And so you know, where it, it could have it been a hindrance in my military career. I think that's been a huge drive in my entrepreneurship now that I'm a civilian, now that I've gotten out. And now mm-hmm. that I've gotten out, you know, I do collect disability. I'm a 60% uh, disabled veteran. So I got that coming in, which is really helpful. It's just like mm-hmm. another rental property. And then yeah. because I have that disability, I don't have to pay a fu- I mean, last time I checked, I don't have to pay a funding fee if I use the VA home loan again. No, you know, and um, I, I've got my disability claim in right now. And I, I mean, I've had, a, you know, a handful of surgeries due to injuries while, you know, in my 20 years. So I'm going to come back with, I'm, I'm going to get a number, you know, I, I, I hope it's, you know, 60%, but uh, um, yeah, that's, that's one extra bonus is uh, we, we have a house under contract that we're going to move into not an investment property. It's, it's going to be home. Um, but uh, we are getting a VA loan on this one as well. And, um, the way that it works, and this is awesome, you know, my, if, if we close and I end up paying the funding fee, as soon as my disability rating comes in, I can apply to, to get that money back. You know, it's just a matter of sending the document to the lender and the lender, you know, is going to deposit that funding fee back into my bank account. So, um, uh, it's definitely one benefit if you are, you know, if you do have any sort of dis- disability, um, I, I, I don't think there's a minimum threshold. Okay. Don't quote me on that one, but. Mm-hmm. I don't, I don't think, think there's a minimum so. threshold. Yeah, so. I don't think there is either. Yeah. Um, and then, for yeah, for anybody out there getting ready to set up their initial disability claim, that's free. You shouldn't have to pay any third-party company to no. get you a rating or a percentage or anything like that. That's actually illegal. And um, make sure you just don't get taken advantage of it because there's a lot of companies out there that will say that they'll represent you and they'll get do a lot of work for you. But the next, you know, you might be paying, you know, three grand for something that you shouldn't even have to be paying for. Yeah. So I was surprised. I mean, talking about that, I was surprised at how easy it was. You know, I, I did it a couple of weeks ago and everybody talks about, you got to get it, you got to get it. And everybody points you to an expert and VSO. And I was thinking it's going to be a complicated process. Um, but when I sat down with uh, the VA rep, it took 15 minutes, Yeah. you know, and it would have been shorter, you know, had I just filled out the form myself. I mean, it, it was it was quick. It was easily easy. Um, now, I haven't gone all the way through the process, but putting in the initial claim, um, you know, he asked me a question, he'd type in the answer. He asked me a question, type in the answer. And, you know, end of the day, it was like, do you need a copy of my medical records? He's like, no. I mean, the military transfers it to the VA. Well, you know, the VA is going to review it. Okay. You know, and then... 
supposedly, you know, within the next month or so, you know, a local doctor is going to call me contracted by the VA yep. and, you know, I've got an appointment with the doctor and it's done, you know, so very, very simple process. Um, you know, it, it does, cause it's a government thing. It's probably going to take a couple of months when, you know, most civilian agencies probably could have done it in, you know, three minutes, but yeah. yeah and now good. if it does, if it does take a delay, you know, if there is a delay, you should get some back pay in there too. But all the all the all the forms and, and directions are online. You know, eBenefits or the VA, mm -hmm. it is a really good website where if you're a very resourceful independent person, you can go out there and do the legwork yourself. And yep. if you do, if you do have a super busy schedule and you're spread thin and you do need some assistance, then you have people like the ones that you just mentioned, VSO, mm -hmm. you know, veteran service officers that can help you fill that stuff out and, and, you know, help you. And then you can also go for an increase. You can request an increase every year moving forward. And yeah. the great thing about this is, you know, when I was transitioning, people were like, bro, I'm not going to go for, you know, any disability. I knew what I was getting into as part of my service. But after you get out and you start working in the civilian world and with the VA, these people understand things about your military service that you might not even be aware of the impact that being of service had on your mental and physical body and what you've done for the country and the armed forces. So there's so there's an aspect or a curtain, or I should say things behind the curtain of which you don't even realize yet. And you might, you might become yeah. aware years down the road. I, you know, I joined the American Legion and I wanted to be around more positive veterans and the things that I've learned since joining the Legion and being around the positive veterans, it's just an incredible mm -hmm. thing. You're like, Oh, wow. I didn't even think about that. You know? So, you know, and I'll, I'll put things in a different picture. You know, a couple of years ago, I was also the mentality, you know, when people were trying to maximize their, their VA benefit, I'm like, you know, you're going to get a retirement. Why does that matter? But when I started thinking about it, you know, I've had two shoulder surgeries, two wrist surgeries. All right. And um, I have a hard time picking up my daughter, mm. you know, and that, that's one of those things where, you know, my, my oldest is now 22. My youngest is six. You know, she, she's about, wow. she's still at the age where I can, you know, I can still pick her up and she still likes to occasionally be, you know, but, you know, it was for the last couple of years with, with my, you know, now six-year-old when she was three and four and would run home, you know, I'd open the door, she'd run in daddy, 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 you know, she would run and jump into my arms. And there was always a couple of seconds of, oh my gosh, this is going to hurt. Yeah. You know, and she'd jump and either my, depending on how she, how I caught her, it was either my wrist or my shoulder, you know, but, uh, you know, look, looking back at that, you know, I'm thinking, you know what? Yeah. They're, they're, it, it's definitely military related. They're all training related extra, um, injuries. You know, I probably should get something for that, you know, because it's, I'm not going to be the same for the rest of my life, you know? So, right. and when the grandkids come along, you know, it's going to be the same thing. I'm going to want to pick them up and, you know, throw them around and do what I do with my kids. But, uh, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to be limited. So yeah, when, when I joined the Navy, my eyesight was good enough to fly jets. They told me in maps, so like, Oh, you, what are you doing? You know, you could be a yeah. pilot. And then on my separation, going through my physicals, I had, uh, you know, my eyes, it said due to diving, like I had mm -hmm. some, you know, decreased yeah, vision compression. Yeah. Literally saying due to diving. And, um, and, but I don't, I don't get anything for it right now. And now mm -hmm. I'm driving at night and it's like the road just emerges, not, and it doesn't help that I live in Connecticut through these Dr. Seuss roads where it's up and down and around the woods, <laughs> you know? So at <laughs> nighttime, I'm like, Jesus, what happened? You know, I yeah. used to pull all nighters driving from Key West back to Connecticut. And now it's like, Oh, yeah. it's after eight. I can't go out. <laughs> yeah. Well, my, my, uh, poor eyesight now, my doctor says it's cause I'm 40 something, you know? So, um, you know, that, that's not, unfortunately, that's not a service related for me. And, you know, sorry that, uh, and I, I can see how that happens. I mean, I'm a, I'm a recreational diver. Um, I, well, I live in Idaho right now, so I, you know, aspire to, you know, dive again someday. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I could understand how, you know, the, the pressure at depth and coming back up and down would, would affect the, the eyesight, but uh, yeah. Well, you know, yeah. you're better than me. I didn't know any of that. I just do my thing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they tell you to dive, so you dive, right? It's like, okay, you know, you know, hit the, I believe button, put your suit up and, and go. Right. Yeah, man. So yeah. awesome. So, um, <laughs> so after that, so we knew mm -hmm. that buying real estate was a good decision because of the mm -hmm. books that you read. And, and what I told new first time home buyers when I was a real estate agent that 
even if it is your primary residence, it's still an investment property. You know, even if you mm -hmm. live in it because you're, you're creating forced savings, you know, real estate is an appreciating, appreciating asset. You're paying the loan down, you're creating that equity, which mm -hmm. is essentially money in your, in your pocket that you can tap into if, and when you need it, and it's going to yeah. increase your, your total net worth. So even if it is just your home, you know, don't think about it like, oh, this is an investment property, especially if you have a home-based business, then you can use a lot of write-offs and essentially pay taxes on less money because you work from home. So there's a lot of ways to hack your primary residence and, you know, despite what you may label it. And so, you know, it's, it's definitely something that you can leverage, you know, somebody that I know just refinanced his house in Southern California, pulled out 200,000 and he's using that money to invest somewhere else, you know, so you know, it's, it's tax something free. tax free as well. Right. And 200 grand I mean, tax free, 200 grand tax free in his back pocket. I mean, his monthly payment is going up, but um, I locked my VA loan, you know, two weeks ago at 2.75 without paying wow. points, wow. all right, without Pretty paying good. points, you know, and it's just, it's one of those things that uh, um, with inflation at, you know, six to 7% right now, and I mean, the, the Fed should really, really uh, release their numbers for December in a couple, in a week, but uh, um, yeah, with inflation at six to 7% right now, if you can lock in, you know, an appreciating asset at two and three quarters percent interest, I mean, that's a steal, especially if you're doing it for almost no money down. But uh, um, yeah, there, I mean, Robert Kiyosaki, I mean, his mindset is he doesn't look at it as an asset because you have to live somewhere and you're paying for it, you know, mm. but you can leverage, like you said, there, there's debt pay down, you know, you're, you're paying down your debt every month. Um, there's appreciation that comes in. You can actually leverage that. Um and, and maybe maybe the house itself doesn't come an asset, but leveraging the house, taking that refinance, you know, or uh, sometimes even a HELOC, you can leverage that uh, equity that you've built and create assets from it. And I, I've seen many, many people do that before. Um, I right. sold I mean, all my- because yeah. you lent it out. I mean, if you're paying such mm -hmm. a low interest rate on that money, could you have that money making more money for you elsewhere versus, a, yeah. you know, versus, versus that super low interest, which is still better than a, a bank CD, but yep. and on, on the single families that I purchased, um, you know, one in 2007, one in 2008, um, it may have been eight, nine, I don't remember. But, uh, you know, there came a time where I had six figures um, of accrued equity in both properties. And mm -hmm. when you looked, when I, when I started looking at the cash flow that I was getting on those six figures, you know, it wasn't a lot. You know, my, my return on equity was a low single digit number. I was getting like, you know, one, 2% return on equity based on how much cash was coming through the gate. Um, and that, that, that's what kind of made me want to sell those properties to tap into that equity and make it work somewhere else, you know? So um, I ended up doing that and that, uh, you know, with, with the eye looking forward towards, you know, multifamily investments. So yeah, I sold those properties, um, you know, um, ended up with three single family homes that we have sold. Um, two of them, we, we netted, you know, a six figure number, you know, low six figures. Um, and on the third one, we, we netted 75 K when we sold it. So, I mean, all, all together, three properties over 300,000 is, is what that put in my back pocket. And if you look at how much I put down, you know, the first one was $33,000, you know, I turned yeah. $3,000 into over a hundred in about eight, nine years, you know, the second one, $15,000 turned into about $140,000. Right. <laughs> and, you know, it's just, it's just one of these things where it's just like, it works, but you know, what the, what, what you said was, is, is accurate. You got to look at, you know, how much your money's making, you know, in one spot versus how much it would make somewhere else. And in, in this case, I had a lot of equity trapped up in single family homes, sold them, was able to move that, that money into multifamily properties. And I'm making a much higher return on that number now. So anyway, that's, that's, that's something that I realized, you know, it, it probably took me too long to realize, um, you know, I, I probably should have sold those a little earlier, but I mean, high sites, 2020. Uh, but then again, if I would have held on to them for a couple more years, instead of, you know, netting hundred K on each one, I probably would have netted 200 K on each one. So, I mean, yeah. Yeah. There, I mean, you could probably make up for that now, given what you're doing and how you're moving mm -hmm. forward in the larger assets, you know, so it's not so much 
oh, could have, should have, would have. Now it's like, oh, what can I do now? I mean, since since I sold those properties, I've almost added a zero. Um, I've multiplied my net worth by by over five, you know. So I I five x my net worth after selling those and putting that money into different assets. Um, had I kept it in there, I mean, yeah, I mean, one house we sold at 420, that's probably worth 650 now. You know, one house we sold at 330, that's probably worth 500 now. But when you look at, even had I held on to those properties, you know, I, st- I, I still am better off having sold it and moved it into something else. Uh, right. Another appreciating asset where more money was working for me, not more money, but the money was working faster. It was more of a work smarter, not harder mindset again. Right. Right. So how did you learn about all this? Like, how, how did you start, you know, tell, you know, yeah, you got, yeah. you read Robert Kiyosaki and that sparked the interest in learning about how to build wealth and cash flow. But like, where did you learn the intricacies, intricacies yeah. of investing in real estate? You know, I, I started out just reading books and starting to call brokers, which, you know, in, in wow. hindsight was the wrong way to do it. You know, um, what, what I didn't realize is what it takes to actually buy a, a multifamily property, you know, and I know that brokers know exactly what it takes to buy a multifamily property. And uh, I mean, the biggest thing is the loan. You have to be able to qualify for a loan. And so um, I, I was getting like no traction whatsoever. And even, even when I got brokers to, to return my calls, um, I remember touring a property. Um, it's actually not too far. I'm in Idaho Falls right now. It was uh, when I was on leave at my in-laws house. Um, you know, yeah, we, we live you know, really close to them right now, but, uh, um, it was like four years ago when I was on leave here in Idaho falls, I went and I toured a property. I think it was a sixplex. And I remember walking out of there thinking, how do I even know if this is a good deal? You know, I know what their purchase price is. I'm like, it needs work. I don't know how to, you know, I don't know how much it's going to take. I don't know, you know, and, and that got me thinking about education. And I ended up jumping into a, a pay to play network, not networking, um, mentorship program. So um, I had just sold one of the single family homes. And so I, I had, you know, a little bit of money in the bank. And so I paid 25 grand for a mentorship program where, you know, I had a one on one mentor who basically walked me through the process. And um, I think that was extremely helpful for, for a lot of reasons. Um, gave me kind of an insurance policy. You know, I, I knew that I had somebody in my court and like, Hey, so I, w- I wasn't going to make a big mistake. You know, I wasn't going to buy that six play six plex completely overpay, then not have enough money to renovate it. Cause the guy that was my mentor had over a thousand units, you know, mm-hmm. he started out with a 20 unit. And so he, he had done everything from, you know, a 20 unit complex to 250. Um, okay. You know, so that was, that was extremely beneficial for me. And, you know, I was able to, um, to leverage him and his expertise to be able to, to learn the business, to be able to create an offer that would get accepted essentially, you know, Mm -hmm. and, um, part of that is to be able to have a team around you, you know, once, once you graduate from like the duplexes and fourplexes, you know, there's, there's a line in the sand somewhere between, you know, five and 50 where, uh, you can't do it alone, right? Um, and every market's a little different. So, you know, our, our first acquisition was a 55 unit and I found three partners and we took that down, right? So um, it was, uh, you know, like I said, the the education, the, the mentorship was absolutely vital in that process. Um, gave me more confidence when talking with brokers. And like I said, it helped me Help me understand the business a little better, so my offers would would be more competitive and and eventually accepted. Nice. Let's talk about the mentorship for a second, because twenty five thousand dollars can be a big chunk of change. It is for a lot of people. It is it's for, not yeah. just you know like a brand new Duke who got an SRB and like now I got cash. What do I do? You know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Nuke is nuclear. You know. I, yep. Yep. I was around yeah. submarines, so. Um, yeah, but yeah. Um, can you shine some insight on that and how that became a good deal and what you were getting for that? I know you got the peace of mind by having mm-hmm. an expert resource that you could rely on and check in with. But, you know, for the person who's listening to this that is going to their local RIA meetings, that is interested in looking for a mentor and a partnership to get their foot in, you know, what were some of the things that you were looking for and what were some of the things that were offered? Well, I mean, first of all, when you are trying, let's go back to, 
you know, what it takes to actually buy a multifamily ap apartment, you know, um, you have to be able to qualify for a loan and lenders are looking for a couple of things. They're looking for net worth. You know, if you want a $2 million loan from a, a bank, they're going to want the team to have at least a $2 million net worth, you know, and that's, that's kind of a hard and fast rule with almost every lender, every lender that I know of. Um, you might have some hard money lenders that'll, um, that'll waive that, but, uh, and then they're also looking for teams with experience, right? And so, you're going to go nowhere in the apartment investing business if you don't have, you know, net worth and you don't have experience. And what that net that that program did for me is it put me around a lot of other people who were trying to do the same thing to help me to assemble a team that had, you know, both the net worth and experience it took to tackle the property. And it was it was a four million dollar property that we purchased, you know. So we we assembled a team with you know, at least four million dollars in net worth. Um, there's some liquidity requirements, you know, that the bank's going to require you to have a certain amount of, um, you know, money available, kind of the rainy day fund, so to speak. They're going to require you to have so much skin in the game. You know, we had to put in, you know, as as the the general partners, we had to put in at least 10% of the money that uh, was required for the down payment. Which I think in our case, we had to put in almost 200 grand of our own money into that first property. You know, so there, there there's a lot of things that are required, and um, the the mentorship helped us to navigate that. You know, things that I just didn't realize up front um, helped us navigate that and put us in in you know the room with a lot of other people who are trying to do the same thing. Um, and incidentally, you know, our, our tribe of Titans is um, something that, that's doing, trying to do the same thing. You know, we've developed this multifamily educational community um, that, you know, a, a lot of the, a lot of things that I talked about, like the, the net worth liquidity, you know, that they weren't really stressed in my mentorship program. My mentorship program was more mechanics. Here's how to underwrite. Here's how to do everything else. Um, but some of these things that I had to learn, you know, on my own, you know, I, I tried to tried to incorporate and and put into, you know, uh, basically take the mentorship program I went through um, and try to add to it, try to make it better and a little more complete, where we actually talk about that up front, you know, hey, you have to be a viable buyer to be able to get a broker's attention, you have to, you know, you have to have certain things, you know, on your side of the fence and in, in your court before you know, you're going to get offers accepted, you know? And so you know, we, we hope to walk people through that as well. Um, and, and one, one, I feel like I'm, you know, doing a big self promo here, but just one, <laughs> one more thing before I get off my soapbox, um, oh, the 26, good. the 26 unit that we closed on, you know, we have now come full circle and we came into that project. Um, someone else got it under contract. We came into that project as the loan guarantors, you know, we provided the experience, we provided the liquidity, we provided the net worth to close on a $2 million property that, you know, the people who got it under contract, they, they couldn't, they didn't have that by themselves. So, right. um, you know, now we're on the other end of the spectrum where we can actually bring those items to the table that a lot of the new investors don't have. Um, and, you know, the, the Tribe of Titans is kind of the platform we use to, you know, educate people, provide that community, provide that, um, you know, it's, it's not a full mentorship program yet, but it soon will be. Oh, yeah, no, especially if you're providing valuable content, you've got the experience and you're doing the work mm -hmm. that it, it almost be a disservice to your organization by not providing the mentorship because you're going to be able to, you're going to get capital available to you through that mentorship that you could implement in the properties that you're acquiring, no matter the size or whatever the deal is. When I, you know, and I, I said Ria earlier, that's real estate investing association. Every, mm -hmm. you know, every area market has one. Okay. And so look up your local one on meetup or wherever if you just start yep. doing some Google, you jump on Facebook um, and look up these groups. You'll be able to go to these meetings and you'll be able to get it a feeling of how they work. I was at the, uh, I was, my first one was Trig, Tidewater Real Estate Investors Group. And mm -hmm. it was a huge family feeling function. You walk in and when the meeting started, they would uh, go over wholesale deals. And that's people with deals that they have under contract that they need to sell ASAP. And mm -hmm. then they're not bidding it, but they're announcing it to the whole room. Who's interested in this? You're raising your hands and you go, and it's almost like expedited real estate real estate investing. So it's actually mm -hmm. really cool. And then you learn a lot, there's resources available, and then you're building that team or that network that you're talking about. 
and, and seeing you know, who can bring what to the table to make something work. And that's one of the things that I love about investing in real estate is that if you are resourceful and creative and you have some drive, there are a lot of ways to acquire real estate, oh, yeah. sometimes with no money at all out of your own pocket. And it just depends on learning the contracts, having the resources and the experience around. And it's really exciting stuff. And when you're like, when you start learning how doable this is, it changes how you look at everything. Yeah. I mean, talking about these RIAs, when I lived at DC, my, my last duty station was the Pentagon. And I, when I lived in the DC Ooh. area, <laughs> Sorry, it sounds great. It's a terrible place to, I mean, it's, it wasn't fun, but. Uh, I hear officers um, like take out the trash and stuff like that. You know, it's like, oh, <sighs> LT, come out you know, here and clean my dip spit. I, I was, there, there's not a, I don't think there's a lieutenant in the entire building, you know, oh, yeah. um, but uh, um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was a battalion XO before going to the Pentagon and, you know, I had a corporal that would run through all of the units travel claims, you know, and then the staff sergeant that would approve the travel claims. I show up to the Pentagon and I am doing travel claims for my shop as a Lieutenant Colonel, you know, and it's just like, you know, I get there and I'm just like, seriously, you're going to have me do this. They're like, yeah, we're going to have you do that. I'm like, we don't have like, no, we don't have any corporals here. We don't have any sergeants. She's like, we have a master gunnery sergeant, you know? So yeah, I mean, the ranks are all elevated, but yeah, I, I think a lot of the times I was at the Pentagon and part of the reason I didn't like it, a lot of the times I was at the Pentagon, you know, as the Lieutenant Colonel, I was doing work that at a battalion level, I would delegate to, you know, my admin staff sergeant or, you know, um, the gunny in the S4, you know, type stuff. So um it's yeah, funny, that, like there's... even at a higher rank and working at the Pentagon, you're still got your countdown. You're like four months, three weeks, two days. Oh four my months, gosh, three weeks, yeah. two days. <laughs> um, you know, there there are some perks. I mean, I got to I got to brief the Commandant of the Marine Corps a couple of times, you know. Cool. Um, one on one with you know General Berger in his office, you know, for over an hour on a couple of different occasions, you know. And you know, there there, there were a couple of times, you know, uh, you know, just I mean, not, nothing in that conversation was classified, but, you know, just um, for offset cases, there, there were a couple of times, you know, he was having a phone conversation with somebody else. Um, and there were a couple of times where he just turned to me and said, what should I say? Mm. You know, and, you know, that that's something that, you know, wow, you know, and my, my job was in international affairs. And I remember the same thing. We would write talking points for the general officers. And I remember sitting in a meeting between, you know, a general, a Marine Corps general and um, a foreign dignitary, you know, and listening to him go straight down the talking points that I had given him the day before. You know, we went into his office the day before, we briefed him, we told him what to expect, everything else. And we gave him a, you know, a two page document saying, if you're asked this, say this, if you're asked yep. this, say this. And, you know, so there, there are definitely things about it that I think, you know, I'll, I'll always remember and very fondly. Um, but, you know, when you looked at the day to day, you know, I don't think those those fond memories came often enough for me to, you know, think of those more often than the I'm spending four hours a day approving travel claims. Oh, yeah, this is yeah. awesome, you know, but uh, um, so, yeah, there, there's definitely some some really, really high points that I had, and, you know, during that tour. But uh, um, anyway, back. Sorry, I, I, I digress. I think that was a fun <laughs> story anyway. But uh, there, there's people I met at RIA's in, in the D.C. area. I saw one of them post yesterday. The guy's got like 60 units. When I first talked to him, he's like, yeah, we're really excited because we just got a duplex under contract. You know? This was like two, two and a half years ago. And I, like I said, I saw a Facebook or I don't remember if it was Facebook or Instagram, but I saw a post on him, on, of his on social media. You know, he just closed on another property. He's at 60 units and it's him and his wife, you know? So, nice. um, you know, I mentioned I've got 600 and something units, but, you know, my ownership share on all of those is, you know, somewhere between, you know, five and 20%, you know, and mm -hmm. he and his wife own a hundred percent of 60, you know, which one's better. I don't know. Um, but, uh, it's the one that works for you. That's the answer. That's a good answer. That's the answer. It's the one that works for you. Um, you know, so yeah, the, the RIAs really help. And, you know, he got a lot of his traction, you know, from the RIAs. It was, show, he was showing up every week. He was listening to speakers. He was talking to people. He was networking. You know, I hopped on a call with him one day and, 
he asked me a bunch of questions on how to proceed. And I, you know, I'm, I'm happy to do calls like that. Um, part of the reason I actually, part of the reason we created Tribe of Titans is because I was spending more time on calls with people who wanted to do what we do. You know, I should have been spending my time finding people who wanted to invest passively with us, but um, I like helping people and people would call and say, Hey, I don't have enough money to invest with you guys, or I have enough money to either go out on my own or invest with you guys, you know? Um, so, you know, a lot of the calls I had, and I was spending a lot of time essentially mentoring people on how to get their first deal. And I started thinking, you know what, I can do this better. You know, I, I, I can, I can help more people if I create this platform, you know, um, I only have so much time, but if I, if I create the content, you know, I can create the content once and, you know, share it with hundreds or thousands of people and help hundreds or thousands of people. And then, you know, as they're going through the content, you know, now I can, I can just answer questions afterwards. You know, I don't have to, I don't have to give the same speech or the same answer, the same questions a million times. I can produce the content, you know, throw it in our tribe of Titans platform, you know, have people, you know, review it at their, you know, at their pace and then ask when they don't understand things and, right. you know, boom, I can help a lot more people. So, yeah. That's the idea. Yeah. So now four Oaks capital is hanging over mm -hmm. your right shoulder. How yep. are they involved with the tribe of Titans or is that your like private equity fund? So, I mean, Four Oaks, yes, through Four Oaks, we, we purchase properties and we raise capital for the property. So when, when I talk about the 600 and something units, you know, nine of nine of 10 of those, you know, come through Four Oaks Capital, where, you know, we as Four Oaks came together, we found the property, we raised the private equity, we put some of our own money in, we got the loans, and now we're managing the assets. So um, you know, it's it's a real estate investment company is what okay, it is. That's your corporation. Probably. Yeah. And, and Tribe of Titans, you know, is is owned by Four Oaks Capital, um, but it's our educational community. You know, we have, you know, a hundred and something people in there right now um, who are, all have the same goal. Um, we have people that are closing on deals very frequently. I think I think four different groups closed on a deal in the month of December, you know, and every time somebody closes on a deal, you know, we bring them on um, in front of the group and it, it, it's it exclusive to the tribe, but it's basically a walk through a deep dive of that particular deal, you know, how they found it, how they funded it, how they, you know, got through all the, the hoops necessary to close. And, you know, there's also this, you know, ability for people to ask questions, you know, so um, I think it's a great thing. We've we got a lot of good people with a lot of good, uh, that are getting good traction, who are closing deals, who are um, able to basically, you know, raise the raise the level of conversation in there, you know. So, yeah. um, and that's kind of one of the, one of the biggest criticisms I had of some of the other groups I was in. It was almost the blind leading the blind, you know. Yeah. So I've I've been involved in a lot of different, you know, I'm using air quotes right now. If you're listening to this, a lot of different masterminds, you know, where. <laughs> Um, it was literally the blind leading the blind. It was one person who had done a little bit more research on multifamily, but still owned zero, you know, who right. was tell, talking to the person who just joined the group and telling them what to do. Um, so yeah, we we're, we're trying to do our best to attract, you know, people who are just getting in along with people who are, you know, further down the road and try to provide value for both. Right, right. Right on, man. I got a couple. Of, do you, how much time do you have? Do you, I got a little more. Uh, okay, actually, cool. let me double check. We're at the top of the hour. I got to just make sure I don't have yeah, a yeah, check. One While more. you're doing that, I want to just say to like you know, the viewers and the listeners is that the common thing, the common thing that I'm hearing in all of Brian's stories, whether it's him uh, speaking from personal experience or, you know, some of the things that he observed is that <clears throat> even if you are the blind leading the blind and I'm not recommending just go out there and start trying to be a leader of something that you don't even know how to speak on, but some of these groups are seeing some type of success. So as you're going out there, don't, don't, <clears throat> don't limit or get in your own way from trying to be successful or investing in real estate, knowing that there's so many people out there trying to do it their own way. And if you're, and just mm -hmm. like Brian's saying, and just like I've said, if you feel like you can do it better, there's an opportunity for you to learn and observe how somebody else is doing business and then get a competitive edge on them 
Because for example, when you're negotiating or if you're creating deals and trying to maximize the discount that you get on these deals, some people are going to use certain language. They're going to communicate mm -hmm. in a certain kind of way and they're already going to position themselves a certain way. Whereas you could position yourselves in a more advanced or more uh, successful manner. Okay. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, the biggest thing is just to go out there and get education and learn. I mean, they say one of the biggest things I learned in my, when I was shopping Ria's was, you know, ignorance on fire is better than knowledge on ice. So you don't get caught up in the forums and trying to learn all the interest intricacies, because then you're just going to get analysis by paralysis and not mm -hmm. get any deals. Yeah. You know, it's as long as you have an attorney in your back pocket and you can say, Hey, this is what I got going on. And please review this. They're going to let you know, yay, mm -hmm. nay. Okay. And that's one of the biggest assets that have helped me in all of my stuff. So, yeah. you know, just, just to piggyback on that one, you know, even with my, my high dollar networking or a mentorship program, sorry, wrong word. Even with my high dollar mentorship program, um, I learned more through trial and error, you know, I mean, my, my mentor would give me advice and general guidance, you know, um, he didn't tell me exactly how, to talk with brokers. He's like, yeah, you just got to call brokers. You have to have your criteria. You have to, you know, and he, he gave me some coaching on, on how to do it, but it wasn't until I picked up the phone and started calling brokers that I really learned what worked and what didn't, you know? And, and um, it's, I, I think, I, I think I like what you said, ignorance on fire. You know, if, if, if you don't know what you're doing and you're going forth and you're taking action, you're going to learn, you know, right. it, it may be the school of hard knocks, but you are going to learn and ultimately, you're going to come out a lot better than the person who has read a million books, you know, knows everything academically, but has never taken action. Right. Right. Exactly. Okay, cool. So do you have a few minutes? Do you have a little bit more time? I got a couple, couple more minutes. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Well, if you were to look back over the last 12 months in your business, mm -hmm. what were the biggest needle movers that had the biggest impact on your business, finances, and life? Just like, what were the biggest things that really helped build that momentum biggest needle movers i think we're finding good partners you know and you know when i was working at the pentagon you know i i played a, a vital role in finding our the first three out of nine properties you know and um with my time limitations at the pentagon having good partners and playing a small role in a larger team ended up being a lot better for me than trying to do everything myself you know had i tried to do everything myself you know, I might have, you know, 30 total units, you know, which better than nothing. And once again, you know, what's, what's better, you know, having a lot of a little or a little of a lot, but uh, um, I, I would say finding good partners and then getting the education has really been what moved the needle the most for me. Okay, perfect. And then as far as like the mistakes you've made over the last year, mm -hmm. what would you warn others not to do so they can avoid making those same mistakes? You know, that, that's, that's a hard question um, just because there, there's so many little things that we've done. You know, I, one thing is um, with lending, you know, you, you got to make sure that your loan matches your business plan. There's different terms, there's different structures for lending, you know, and I think on our first property, um, that was probably the biggest mistake we made is we got a loan that didn't match our business plan. Right. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, overall, we're going to be fine. You know, the, the market has appreciated enough that, um, you know, we're still going to make a boatload of money on that property and our investors are as well. Um, it's just tied our hands. You know, basically right now, if we were to sell, we would owe the bank a million dollars as a prepayment penalty on a $4 million yeah. property, right? So um, essentially, you know, not having a loan that matched our business plan is going to force us to hold that property um, we've owned it for three years. It's going to force us to own that property for probably another five before that prepayment penalty burns down to something that's more palatable. So I would say that's, that's one big thing. Um, you know what? And you only asked for one. So we'll let's just stop right there. Perfect. Perfect. All right, Brian, well, where can people get a hold of you? Uh, and what's next? You know, what's next? Um, you know, I, I, I I said that we're going to have mentorship in the tribe of Titans soon, you know, within the next couple of months, we're going to launch a capital raising course for multifamily. It's going to be a group course. We're going to have, you know, everybody show up, you know, once a week at a certain time, and it's going to help people go from, you know, zero to able to raise a million dollars. Or if you're able to raise a million dollars, well, hopefully, you know, five to 10 X the amount you can raise, 
um, you're just going through the steps. So um, we've raised $15 million, you know, in the last two and a half years. And I, I think right now we're in a position to where we can help other people do what we're doing. And, you know, that's, that's really what my focus is in the business is, is to help other people do what we're doing. Um, one of my partners is, is looking for new acquisitions for Four Oaks. Another one of my partners is managing the assets. You know, my job is to help other people do what we're doing. Perfect. And where can people get a hold of you or find more information? Good question. So my email, Brian Briscoe at fouroakscapital.com. Um, if you're interested in the Tribe of Titans, it's the tribe of titans.com. And, uh, you know, if, if you reach out to me, it is a pay to play platform. You know, it's 30 bucks a month, not going to kill anybody. Um, but, you know, reach out to me, I'll give you 30 days free. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you so much, Brian. And if you need any help with the, you know, the private money raising or the intricacies on that or forming any business entities for structuring your business to pay as little taxes as possible, both Brian, the tribe of titans and the listeners, viewers out there, I am more than excited to provide my resources that have worked for me so you can mm -hmm. still um, capitalize on all the opportunities. All right. Awesome. All right, Brian, thank you so much, Mr. Briscoe. Everybody check out the Tribe of Titans and Four Oaks Capital. Learn what Brian's doing from what he's done on his own experience. And we'll have some links below <clears throat> no matter where you're watching or listening to this. Okay, make sure you follow, subscribe, hit the bell icon and uh, drop a comment below. Let us know what you learned. So when people come, and look at this episode. They know exactly what we're talking about, what you learned, and we can help expedite their success and their learning curve, okay? Absolutely. So, hey, thanks a lot, Robert. Yes, sir. You're welcome. Look forward to connecting with you more. We should do this again. Let's have another episode going over the different Absolutely. aspects, maybe the roles, and um, just check in. Yep, just say when. All right, brother. Thank you so much. I will talk to you soon, everybody. They say that the rising tide lifts all ships and courage is contagious. So help Brian and I help you help your friends. Absolutely. Right. Thanks.